So we started module eight of last session. Uh, we covered the basics of the memory hierarchy and why we need it. Uh, we talked about the trade-offs, of course, and the location. We talked about the memory hierarchy. It's actually very displaced to, so it's closer to the processor. It has a different technology. We mentioned that we have SRAM, DRAM, and other technologies. Uh, that can be faster, and we always have this trade-off. That when it comes faster, we usually have a smaller uh, memory, and it's a little bit more expensive. And Regina asked a good question last, at the end of the class, uh, and when we talk about the cost, we're not just talking about the dollar amount, we're talking about the power consumption, area consumption, area occupation, and everything. So you can use technologies like flip-flop, for example. Flip-flop is a bad example, but for example, you can use SRAM in main memory. Sure, you can do it, but it's going to be very large in those capacities that you're targeting. If you don't have to realize it because of SRAM technology, we're talking about a huge chip, which is something that we want to avoid. Um, so when I talk about the cost here, it's not really just the dollar amount, although that's a, that's a part of the cost. But the power consumption area occupation is also important when it comes to the chip. It's actually very important. A lot of papers we publish in the lab, we just focus on area occupation and power dissipation. So that's something that we brag about when we have a good design. But that's the cost. As well. So something that was important was the principle of locality. And that was why something like cache or memory hierarchy works. We mentioned that a lot of programs that we have, uh, they have these kind of features that they, are, they either have temporal locality, like a case in this code that you have that we want to keep uh, accessing the same block in the memory at a different time, and which that is a temporal locality. Or we have a spatial locality, which was an example like this, or your code for project one. When you access a specific location in memory, there's a high chance that you want to access the location around it too. And those with your code that you have. And because of that, cache works because we can bring a chunk of data to a memory that is faster, that is closer to the processor, and we can save uh, time, we we'll have speed up, and so on. Um, and that is what is called spatial locality. Maybe a core look at special character, and that's why some the cache or that type of memory hierarchy works. Okay, so talk a little bit about this. This was where we stopped last time. We uh, talked about the, the hit different terminology that we have for cache. Hit rate, hit time, miss rate, and miss time. Hit rate is uh, portion of the memory accesses that are actually in the cache. We have a load board, we don't have to go to the main memory, for example, to get the data, that's the hit rate. Or the portion of the memory accesses that we have in the program actually uses cache as the main memory. But you can extend it to different layers of the cache. You can have the hit rate for the layer one, and then you can have hit rate for layer two, and so on. And miss rate is opposite of hit rate is one minus hit rate. And the miss penalty and hit time. Hit time is the time that we check to see whether the data that we want exists in the cache plus the time that the other pen, the time that it takes to move the data from cache to a register in the processor. The miss penalty is the time to check whether the data is in the cache. And because it's not in the cache, it doesn't have to go to the main memory, bring the main memory from main memory to cache, and from cache to registers. Okay. Um, so now, I think it was at the, again another question that, I, that we got last time at the end of the class was something Abdullah asked, and that was about address sequence. So how do we address cache and main memory? Because we did talk about calculating the base address, offset, and everything, and find the address in the main memory. But do we have a different address for the cache? Right? So, moving forward, I'm going to introduce different types of caches. 
and today we're going to cover one of them, the direct map cache. A big difference in these caches is how we address different locations in the cache, which depends on the architecture of the cache, of course. But the thing that we need to know is that we don't use a different address to find a value in the cache. The same address that is used for accessing a location in the main memory is used to also address a location in the cache. How are we going to talk about it? So we are going to start with a very simple example, a very simplified architecture that only has a simple cache. It has one word in each block. So pretty straightforward. We just have one block and we have one word in each block. And to make it even simpler, each word has one byte. Make it super simple. Um, let's say we have this cache and then we keep building on top of that and make it more complex. So the things we wanna the questions we wanna and answer is that how do you want to, uh, how do we know if that word that we're looking for is in the cache? And if it is in the cache, how can we find it? Okay, so we have to do two things every time we have a memory access and we have a memory hardware key because obviously all the data is going to be in the main memory, but the subset of the data is in the cache. So every time we have to check whether the data that we are looking for is in the cache or not. So that's the mechanism that we have to explain how we want to do it. And then, if it is, how we can address that specific byte that we need. Something that we need to keep in mind is that memory in MIPS is byte addressable, okay? So all the addressing that we do is pointing to a byte, even in the main memory, right? When we're calculating the address through offset plus uh, base, we are addressing a byte in the memory, not a word, okay? Because it's a byte addressable number. Uh, but here we've simplified it, and we said that every word is one byte, so it's just super simple. Um, but now let's see how we can answer these questions. So one strategy, one type of the cache that is very well known is a direct map cache, or the direct mapping strategy that we can use. It's very straightforward. Uh, we have just actually the simplest way of addressing the location of the cache. And for each word in the memory, we have a specific address in the cache, right? So every block in the main memory has a specific address in the cache as well, okay? So how do we find the cache line that, these are other terms that we talked about, how do we find the cache line that that content of the main node memory that we want to access to exists? is through a simple mod function. So you get the block address and you get the cache line corresponding to that block address in the main memory is equal to the block address and modulo of number of blocks in the cache. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna explain these with some examples so don't make it complicated for yourself. So it's gonna it's gonna get easier. Uh, but this is plan to see for now. So we use the model loop to calculate this. And mod function is actually very simple to implement. It's kind of free. And I'll explain that to actually in the next slide. So this is an example of a direct map cache. Okay? So we have a main memory that has 32 words. And then we have a cache for 32 blocks. Okay, but, but it's the same thing. We have one word in each block, one byte in each word. So we have 32 blocks here. And then we have a cache that has eight lines. Okay? So now we want to see how we connect each of the locations in the memory to a location in the cache. In a direct map cache, every location stick stuck with one line in the cache. So these two, for example, this location here, you see the blue, all of these locations are connected to that specific line in the cache. So every time we want to address this location in the main memory, we can check this address in the cache and see if it already exists there. And if it doesn't exist there in, in that location, we go to that specific place in the main memory and put it in this address. 
So every location in the main memory is connected to a specific location in, in cache, and that doesn't change. That is why it's called direct now. Okay. But how can we find the address? Is through the mod operation. So what does it really mean? Let's take a look at this example. We have eight lines here, as I said. And let's say we want to address this one. So this is location 0, 0, 0, 0, 001 in the main memory, which is address 1. So 1 mod 8 would be 1. Right? So it means that we have to check this location, location line 1, in the cache for the content that we're looking for in the main memory. Okay? If we know the address for the main memory, we get the mod of that address, and then that's going to be the address for the cache. Okay? So it can either exist in this location or not. If it doesn't exist in this location, then the content that we're looking for, we have to go to the main memory and bring it here. Okay? But something that you can see is that in line 9, the block 9 is also connected to the same thing. We get uh, mod 9, mod 8 of 9, we get 1 as well. And if we don't know what mod is, it's just divided and look at the remainder. Okay? So we divide 9 by 8, and to look at the remainder, the remainder would be 1. It is also connected to the same line in the cache. Okay? And this is another example. Like the average 29, if we get 29 mod 8, it's going to be equal to 5. So this location is connected to address 5. Okay? So it keeps getting uh, more clear when we go forward. So that's just a simple direct map cache. Every location in the block in the memory is connected to one location in the cache. Okay. But the good thing about the mod is, uh, and, and that's why I kind of say it's for free, you don't really have to divide it by that number and check the remainder. Right? So when you have a mod 8, for example, in this case, your remainder can be numbers from 0 to 7. Right? So you just need to check the bits, some of the bits in the main memory address to see what location uh, it belongs to in the cache. Okay, and the way you do it is you check the cache lines, see how many cache lines we have here. In this case it's 8. And then you get log, and that cache lines, let's say it's n. We get log n of that number. So in this case it would be 3. And we just look at the first three bits in the address. So it could be something like this. We just look at the first three bits, and that is the address for the cache. Okay? So this is, for example, 11101, which is 29. If we just look at the first three bits, 101 is the line in the cache that is address through that main memory address. Okay? So you just look at the slides and you some bits in the main memory address to find the address for the cache. And that's the entire idea of address that you cache. So you have the main memory address and there are some bits in that address that are used to find the location in the cache. Okay, but this is a simple case and because of that we can just simply get mod, you know, three, mod 8 of that and find it. But it gets a little bit more complicated. Okay, so that's why we call getting this model of this kind of free for us. Now, obviously there's going to be a challenge here. Right? Obviously the challenge here is that there are many locations connected to one location in the cache. Okay? And when we want to access the specific data, how do we know that we're actually looking for the data that we need? Right, because I can store this data from this location to the cache while I'm still while I'm looking for the data in another in another, another location. So how do we fix this problem? Okay. So that's the concept of tag. But now we're defining different fields if they have this. Right? We defined the lines already. Now we are defining tag. So what is tag? Tag in this case is whatever is left in the address, main memory address. So this looks at the lines 
And this tag is used to make sure if that's actually the content that we're looking for. Okay, you see we have 101 connected to these 101 line in the cache. But if you look at the tag for these locations, they all have different tags. 00011011. Right? So what you need to do, you check this line and you check the tag, and through this two-level addressing method, you can find whether this is exactly the data you're looking for or not. Okay, so you can consider having this long addresses and we're checking, kind of comparing everything, we break it down to smaller pieces. So we have line, now we have tag. Okay, keep adding to this. So you can see where we're going with that. So we have lines, tag, so forth. There's another bit that is called valid bit. Okay, so valid is just simply telling me whether the value that you have in the cache can be used or not. So one example that it cannot be used is when you start the processor. At the startup, whatever is in the cache is not good, right? The program should work and it should put something in the cache. So whatever is left in the cache, it's just the data that we don't wanna use. So that valid bit is used to make sure that when you're accessing the cache, that data is actually reliable. Okay, so three fields so far, three bits. Uh, three bits, we have more bits, but three um, fields. We have the valid bit, which is actually one bit, is a yes or no. We have tag and we have line. Okay? And don't forget, this is a very simple catch. We had an assumption in the beginning before starting talking about this, and that assumption was that you know we have a cache, it has just one block in every line, and it has one byte in every word. We're still moving forward with that assumption. Okay. So tag, line bits, and value bit. So now let's have an example based on that simple cache that we just talked about. Okay. So this example has a CPU references, reference addresses of 22, 26, 22, 26, 16, 3, 16, and 18. Okay. So these are the memory, the reference addresses that we have in a program. We don't know what that code is, but let's say we have a program that is going to access these, it, it wants to have access to these addresses. What we want to do is we want to see the content of the cache and see how it changes, if it's a direct map cache, and what's the hit rate. Okay, so we start with the first number, which is 22. In the cache that we just explained, we mentioned that we have three lines. This has, if you look at the lines, we have eight lines here. So it means that we used log eight is going to give me three, so I need three bits to find the line index, line information. So these three bits are used to find the line, and then we have the other two bits for tag. Right? So when we change the number 22, this binary representation, you have one zero one one zero. Okay. So now, the, what is the cache line for this address? Is one one zero. Okay. So this is the cache line. We go and check the cache line one one zero. If you check the valid bit, the first thing you check is the valid bit. When you check the valid bit, because we're just starting the processor. It is telling me that the content of this register, this cache, is not reliable. So it's going to be missed anyways. That's the first time we want to access this cache, and it's going to be missed. So the valid bit is no. We go to this index, check the valid bit, and it's going to be a miss. Okay, so now what do we do when it's a miss? Now we want to go to the main memory, and we want to bring that content from that memory address and put it in the cache. What is that content? This is content address 22. Okay, so now in this line of the cache, we're gonna have the data that is stored in address 10110. But this 10110 is the address in the main memory. So if we go to the main memory to that address, we bring the data from that location, that block in the main memory, and bring it back to the cache, but to what line of the cache, to which line of the cache, to line 110. Okay, 
But what is the tag for this? We have the line index. What is the tag? Tag would be one zero coming from this part. And we put the tag because we want to fix that problem that there are many different locations in the main memory that have the line index of one one zero. The cache line index of one one zero can belong to different locations. That tag is helping us that when we are checking the content of the cache next time, we're looking at the tag to make sure that, okay, whatever is in this line is coming from address 10110. If the tag doesn't match, then it's going to be a miss again. All right? But now the valid bit is on, well, it's going to change to yes to. So this data is valid now. Any questions? I'm hoping that this is getting a little bit more clear, but any questions before moving to the next one? I'm going to do the same thing with every memory, all the memory addresses that we have here. Okay, so let's move forward. Maybe with the next example is going to give you a little bit more information. So the next one is 26. Okay. So maybe you can help me with this. Okay, just give you a second if you want to contribute. You can. Uh, we have the binary address 11010 here. So what would be the cache line? Zero, one, zero. Okay. So then we have to go to the line zero, one, zero. Would it be a hit or a miss? Miss, because the valid bit is no. Okay. So this is a miss. Now, what we need to do is we need to go to the memory address one, one, zero, one, zero. Bring that content and put it in line zero, one, zero and move the tag of 1, 1 to the tag no, field and change the value bit to yes. Okay. So now we can see that the cache is being populated. We're moving data to the cache. Uh, so now let's look at the next two. We have 22 and 26. Okay, we do both of them together. 22 has the line address or cache line address 1, 1, 0. Now I go to the cache line address 110, and I check the valid bit, and it's yes. So it means that there is something there. I still don't know if it's what I'm looking for. It says whatever is in the cache is valid. So the next thing I have to do is do what? Check the tag, right? Because we know there's something in the cache, but we don't, and we know there's something in that line, but we don't know if it's actually coming from address 22, or it's coming from out of six, right? If it was six, we'd have the same line and the value would be yes, but the tag would be zero, zero, okay? So when we look at this, the tag is one zero here. The tag that we have here is also one zero. So that means that it's a hit, okay? So we have address 26, line same story. Line zero, one zero, we check there. There's something in that line. We check the tag, the tag is equal, then it means that yes, the content is in the cache, is what we're looking for. And right there we have another hint. Right? Now let's go to 16. Okay, 16, 3, 16. So the cache, what is the cache line for 16? 0, 0, 0. So we go to the line 0, 0, 0. We check the valid bit. It's a no. So is it hit or miss? What it means is we have to go to the address 10000 and we'll move it to the data. What is the tag for this one? It's 10. Okay? So 10 is a tag. The data would be memory, address 10000, and the valid bit would be yes. Okay? Next one is 3. What is the cache line for 3? 011. Is it a hit or a miss? Miss because the valid bit is no. So then this content is going to change. The tag would be 0, 0. The content is coming from the address 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. The valid bit is yes now. Okay. 16. 0, 0, 0. We go and check the line 0, 0, 0. The content is valid, so there's something there. The tag for this one is 1, 0. The tag here is 1, 0. So it's a hit. Okay. So now let's go to the last number, which is 18. Okay, 18. The binary representation for 18 is 10010. What is the cache line for this? 
zero, one, zero. We go here, and it's valid. It means that there is something in the cache. So the next thing we need to do is checking the tag. That's right. What is the tag on this one? What's the tag here? Then we're going to have a hit or miss. It's going to be missed. So what do we do here? Exactly. We're going to replace the content. The tag is going to change. The memory is going to change. The content is going to change. One zero one zero one zero. Now we lost what we had here before. Okay. So this is it. If I check the hit rate, I have eight references to the memory and only three hits. So hit rate wise, thirty seven point five percent. This happens at the beginning of the program. Okay. But the further you go, the better it gets. And also, if you have arbitrary addresses here, and that's something that doesn't really happen in the program, too. You're not just, they're not just simply random going from 16 to 3, from 3 to 22. Locality, right? You don't forget the locality. This is for the sake of the example here to see how the cache hit and miss happens. Okay, so, but this was a very simple cache. Let me see. This was a very simple cache that we just talked about. And I have, from the beginning, I said that we're going to have one block per line, one word in each block, and one byte in each word. But that's not really the case in a realistic cache. Okay? So now let's go and see a realistic case. We have a cache that has many lines. In each line, we have Block. And also line and block size are the same. These are the technologies again. We have cache line and we have the block in the main memory. It's the same size. But inside the line, each line, we have two to the m words. We have two to the n lines. And in each line, we have two to the m words. And in each word, we have two to the w bytes. Okay, so this is a realistic case. This is actually a realistic case, but it can happen. So now let's see how a direct map cache works and what are the addresses, what are different fields in a generic direct map cache. The first one is the size. The first thing we have to check is the size of the main memory. So the size of the main memory, as you can see here, is, has, has two to the A, two to the A bytes. Okay. So and also every we use and this is this is usually the case if you look at the cache sizes in your computers they work with binary numbers so it's a huge thing you don't really get a cache size of 131 so right so for so the main memory size it has two and eight bytes memory is byte admissible okay so if I have two to eight bytes in memory and I have a byte addressable memory how many lines do I need? to address every byte in the memory. How many bits do I need to address every byte in a memory that has two to the eight bytes? So we, this is, we're going back to the first module. If I have four bytes here, how many bits do I need to address each of these locations. This address for this one is 0, 0, and then 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Right, so with two bits, I can address four different bytes. Right, that makes sense. So if I have two to the A bytes in the memory, I need A bits to address every single byte in that memory. Right, but this defines the length of the address, okay, the length of the address. What do we care about this length of the address? Because everything else that we want to add us in the cache should be within the same address. Okay, should be inside the same address. So like M, W, N, everything we want to explain should fit in that size, okay? So we have eight A bits for addressing a memory that has two to the A byte capacity. The next, next thing you want to check is that how many lines we have in the cache. If we have two of the n lines in the cache, then we need n bits to address each line. 
So in the cache, we need n bits to find what line the data that I'm looking for belong to. If I have two to the m words in each line, then I need m bits to find the word in each line. Okay, and if I have w bytes in each word, two to the w bytes in each word, then I need w bits to address every byte in the word. So you see how it is happening? We have the main memory that has two to the a bytes. We need a bits to address every byte in the main memory. But when it goes to the cache, if you want to find the specific byte in the cache, the first thing we need to do is to find what line of the cache that data belongs to. When we find the line, we have to find which word in the line that data belongs to. When we find the word, we have to find what, which byte in the word that data that we're looking for belongs to. Okay, so we start from the line, go to the word, and then to the byte. And this is how it works. Okay, so we're looking for a specific byte in the word, and that's how we do it. So, in the case of MIPS, a is always equal to 32. In MIPS processor, we know that every word has four bytes. So W is always equal to two. Okay. But it doesn't have to be the case. We can have processors that have words that have they have eight bytes. A byte is always eight, eight bits, but word is not always four bytes. Word depends on the processor that you're using. If you actually have a 64-bit processor, every word has 8 bytes. If you have a 32-bit processor, every word has 4 bytes. Okay, so now, the thing that is left is tag. So I know M, N, I know A, which is the length of the address. Then I have N, which is the number of bits I need to find the cache. Line. And I have M, which is the number of bits that I need to find the word in the cache line. And I have W to find the bytes in the in that word. And whatever is left would be tag. Okay. So now you can see why that happened in the in the example that we have. In our example, we mentioned that every line has one word, just one word. Okay. So if every line has one word, it means that m would be equal to zero. We don't need a bit to address different words in the line. You don't need to do address, but there's just one word in line anyways. You don't need an m field, that would be zero. Then we also mentioned that every word has only one byte, which means that w would be zero too, because we don't have different bytes in the word. And that was why we just had N and T. So when in that example, we just had the line index and we had the tag and nothing more, because that was oversimplified. But if you want to have a generic case that has different words in line and different bytes of words, then we have to bring M and W to the, uh, to our, uh, to the picture. So now we can see here the tag, which is whatever is left, would be A minus N plus W plus M. Okay. So now, as always, I think examples always help. So let's have some examples. Okay, we have a 16 megabytes of byte addressable main memory. Yeah. And we also have a cache capacity of 64 kilobytes. And if you don't already know it, just remember that the kilo is 2 to the 10, mega is 2 to the 20, giga is 2 to the 30. These are things that you should know. And then we have a block size of 4 words and word size of 4 bytes. Okay. 
So how wide is main memory address bus? To find that, we have to see how many bytes. I solved the first one, and then you can do the next one. To, to find that, we have to find how many bytes we have in the main memory, and then get the log of that to find A. So we have 16 megabytes in the main memory. 16 is 2 to the 4, and megabytes to the 20. Exponent rule is 2 to the 24 bytes. So we have 2 to the 24 bytes in the main memory, which means A will be equal to 24. So we have 24 bits in the address. So when you ask the main memory address bus, we have 24 bits in the main memory address bus. Now the next question is how many blocks are in the main memory? How many blocks do we have in the main memory? So there are different ways to answer this question. You can find the words and see how many words we have in the main memory or you can find the bytes. But I just have one example here. So we have four words in each block, right? And we have four bytes in each word. What it means is that we have 16 bytes in each block, right? So we have 16 bytes in each block, and we know that the main memory has 16 megabytes of capacity. So if we divide the 16 megabytes that we have here by the 16 bytes that we have per clock, we can find how many blocks we have. So you basically find the block capacity you have the main memory capacity, you divide the main memory capacity by the block capacity, and then you get that many blocks. So 2 to the 24 is the memory size. You have 16 bytes per block, and if you divide it based on the exponent rule, you're going to get 2 to the 20 blocks. Which means, in this case, when we say how many blocks we have in the main memory, we don't really care about that in the cache. Right, so it doesn't have like an equivalent parameter that's it's not n m or whatever, it's just a question about the number of blocks in the cache in the main memory. But how many lines do we have in the cache? First thing you need to know is that the block size and the line size are equal always. The main memory block size is equal to the uh, cache block size. Okay. So with that information, we know that the cache line size would be 16 bytes. We already calculated that. We have 16 bytes in each line. Now, if I know the cache capacity size, the same way that I calculated the number of blocks in the main memory, I can calculate the number of lines in the cache. Okay. So the cache size is 64 kilobytes, and I know the line size is 16 bytes. So if I divide this, 64 kilobyte would be 2 to the 16, because 64 is 2 to the 6, kilo is 2 to the 20, 2 to the 10, so we get 2 to the 16, and we divide it by 2 to the 4th here, and it gives me 2 to the 12 line in the cache, which makes n equal to 12. Okay, here I don't care about the n, I'm not asking about the n, but if you wanted to calculate the n, we have 2 to the 12 lines in the cache. If I get log of this, it gives me 2 to 12, and it means n would be equal to 12. Which means 12 bits out of the 24 bits that I have would be for the cache line address. Okay, that's one example. Now, any questions here? Before moving forward. So now let's talk about the field encoding. Okay, how do you encode the address bus to address a specific location in the cache? Don't forget again, everything is byte addressable, so our goal is finding the address for specific bytes in the cache. Okay. So now we have this field encoding for the direct map cache. So in the direct map cache we have different fields. We have W, M, N, and T, as we explain what they are. Okay. And then we have A, which is the data, uh, the, the, the size of the address bus. So to find the size of the address bus, we have to find the main memory capacity. 
uh, the cache capacity, if you have that, you can find the lines. If you have two to the end lines, we need end bits for the cache line. But this is going to sit in this field. Then we have M for the words in the line. We have M bits there. And then we have W bits for the bytes in the words. In the first example that we have, which is a very simple case, the W was zero because we had one byte in each word, the M was zero because we had one block, only one word in each line, and we just had N and T. Okay, that was a very specific case. Now this is the direct map cache field that coming. So I can give you a question like this. So we have your task to design a MIPS based ultra lightweight IoT sensor powered on the ambient Wi Fi signals. It has 20, 256 bytes of main memory, a 64 byte direct map cache, and a block size of two boards. The first question is how many bits wide is the address bus? What is it? Go ahead, roll. It's eight. Why is it eight? Because it's two to the eight. We have two fifty six bytes in the main memory. So that's the capacity of the main memory. Two fifty six into the eight, which means that we have eight bits of add response. That's correct. Okay. Which makes A equal 8. We have 8 bits. So, how many lines are in the cache? We have 64 byte direct map cache. And we have a block size of 2 words. And it's nib spaced. So this is the only thing that you need to know. MIPS has, every word in MIPS has four bytes. That's the information that is implied and it's not clearly mentioned here. Because we just said it's a MIPS-based processor. So every word in MIPS has four bytes. And we have the block size of two words, which means that the block size has eight bytes. Block size equals the line size, so we have 8 bytes in each line, and we have a total of 64 bytes in the cache. Now, how many lines do we have? 8. We have 8 bytes in each line, and we have 64 bytes total. If I divide that, we get 8 bytes. Sorry, we get 8, which means 8 lines in the cache. But if we have 8 lines in the cache, what would be the end? It would be three. As eight is to the three, that's how many lines we have in the cache. And three would be the number of bits that we need to end. Yeah? So we can find, but this is another way of doing it too. As I said, you know, you don't have to stick with one way. You can find the word in the cache, or you can find the bytes in the cache, it doesn't matter. So in this case, we find how many words we have in the cache, and how many words we have in the block, and then with, with the division to find anything. Okay. Is this clear? I don't want to get confused. So this is just finding how many words we have in the cache, and then because we know how many words we have in the block, we cache how we find you know, the lines in this. If n is equal to 3, it means that we need 3 bits. Out of the 8 bits that we have here, 3 bits would be for the cache line. So, now the other things we need to find is m and w. Okay, m means how many words we have in each line. So how many words, to find m, we have to, we have to check that. It doesn't mean that. You know, we have to check how many words we have in each line. So how many words we have in each line? Two. Which means how many bits we need to address to these two words? Yeah, right. We have one bit. So it means that two to the m is equal to two, which makes m equal to one. Okay. 
but how many bytes, the next thing is finding W. How many bytes do I have in each port? It's MIPS, so I have four bytes in each port, which makes W equal to two, right? We have W equal to two, we have two bits for W, we have one bit for word, we have three bits for line, and whatever is left is for tag. So we're going to have two bits for tag. Does this make sense? I'm definitely going to ask a question like this in the midterm exam. I'm sure you're going to have a question like this. It's going to get more complicated because we're going to define different cache types. So you have to know all of them. It's just this is this is direct map, but we're going to have a set associative cache, fully associative cache, and they have their own fields too. Okay, so this is it. Uh, so how, so let's see how are these bits in this example that we just explained are actually used in the cache. So that example in mind, let's say we have these memory addresses here, the different memory addresses here. Um, the two bits, the first two bits would be used for the tag. Then we have the next three bits for the line. And then we have the next bit for board, and then we have the next two bits for bytes, right? Uh, the way it works is that if we have, let's say we have board zero and board one here, this is a case that we have two boards in each block. Okay, so when we have two boards in each block, something interesting happens, and that's where we can use the spatial locality and so on, right? So how it works is that we have Let's say we want to find this word zero. The word zero has the index of zero, zero, zero. Okay. So it means that it's going to sit in the first line. But when we go here, we have two places for more. Although we just want to access this line and this word, when we go to the cache, we bring the data in every address that has the same cache index, cache line index, and tag. So every line, every address that has the same tag, and has the same cache line index, will be brought to the cache anyways. And it will be put in that line, even if we don't really want it. So the way it works is that, although we just want to get word zero, we go and bring the word zero to the cache, but if you look at the line index, we have 0, 0, 0. If you look at the tag, we have 0, 0 here. So we bring everything from every memory address that shares the same tag and same index, which would be this case here. Okay, so now this is going to sit here, although we didn't really want to access that. That's how it is used. That's how special locality works. When you go there for one of them, you bring everything that has the same line, cache line index, and the same tag. Okay? So that was the bias, and this is what I just explained. So when you go there, you bring more than one word. You bring multiple words, depending on how many words you have in the cache line. Because that's how many words that are sharing the same index line, cache index, you know, address, and the tag. Okay, so now, this is another example, and we just want to calculate the total cache capacity. If you want to know how many extra bits we have in the cache, of, like from this example, we have eight lines in the cache. We have two data words per line. It means that we have six words of 16 words of data in each line. 16 word, 16 words in the whole cache. We have eight lines, two words. It means that we have 16 words of data in the cache. So this is the data part of the cache. But we also have a two-bit tag per line, one valid bit per line. Okay. So if we add them up with a direct map strategy, and assuming that we have 32 bits per word. It's just a simple math. We have eight lines multiplied by the number of bits per line, which is 32 
plus 32 plus 2 plus 1. And if you multiply these two, you get 536 bits in the cache. Okay. So this cache needs has 536 bits, but we only use 8 times 32 plus 32 of them. We only have access to that. But these parts are just stored, reserved there for addressing. As user, as programmers, we can't change those guys. That's something that is set by itself automatically and it's used for checking whether the data exists there or not. So every cache that we have, when you look at the size, is actually bigger. The amount of memory that we have in the cache is actually bigger than what it is reported because there's a lot of data points, data bits that are used for checking whether the data exists there or addressing and so on. Okay. But these are the things that we never mention in the specs of the cache. Yeah, does that make sense? It's pretty clear, right? So now, <clears throat> let's have another question. We have a turret map cache which has 64 lines with block size of 16 bytes or four words. Okay, we have 60 lines block size 16 bytes or four words. So that is kind of giving us how many information about how many bytes we have in each word to interact with, right? So each line in the cache with the content in memory, main memory address 1200 exists. So we have which line in the cache would hold the content in the main memory address 1200. I'm giving you a main memory address 1200, and I want you to tell me which line in the cache would hold this the content of this address. So there is there are different ways to fix to solve this problem. One way is it's actually in the book. If you look at the book, they have again two different mods, and then fight it. But the thing that is more common sense to me, and you don't have to really memorize anything, is just use field encoding, bit field encoding. So if you use bit field encoding, and then you get the 1200 as the address, and just put it in the bit field encoding, you find it, right? So now let's do the bit field encoding first. We have 64 lines. It means that n is equal to 16. I'm sorry, 6. n is equal to 6. So 64 is 2 to the 6. n would be equal to 6. And it says that's a direct map cache. So we have that information. We know that the bit field encoding for direct map cache has n, m, w. So now we have to start finding n, m, and w. You have 6 bits for n. For m, we want to know how many words we have in each line. So it already tells me that I have four words in each line, which means that m would be, I have four line, four words in each line, what would be the m? It would be two, right? Because we have two to two words in each line. So m would be two. And it also implies the word size because it says 16 bytes or four words. I mean, each word has four bytes. So when each word has four bytes, what would be the W? Two as well. Okay. So the thing that we don't have here is A. We don't know the main memory size. But the good thing is that we don't even need it. We don't care about the main memory size at this point. So what we need to do, we just create this block. Let's just tag B, whatever it is. It might have how many bits per tag, we don't care about it. So we have two bits in bytes, two bits in the words field, and six bits here. So now 1200, if you change it to a binary number, it would be something like this. 100101100000. So that's the binary representation of 1200. So now what you need to do, this is an address, right? You have to put this address in the field, in the bit field representation. So if you do this, you get 0, 0 here, another 0, 0 here, and you have 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0 here, and a 1 here, but we don't care about that. Right? 
So now we have these numbers in the fields. So now let's look at the question. The question is asking which line in the cache would hold the content in main memory address 1200. So you, what you need to do is you just need to know where n is because you want to know where each line in the cache. n is here and we just look at this number. So what is this number? This is 11. All right. So it means that this memory address, the content, the data in that memory address exists in line 11 of the cache. Okay. So you could have solved this question. This is something that I, when I was reading the book, I decided to solve it this way because there's another way. I actually had this slide and I just removed it entirely because I know it makes sense. You can get in the mod of the blocks and then you find the block and then you can find them. We get the mod of the cache and everything. But from my point of view, it's just the common sense of getting the pitch fold encoding and put it there. Okay. So this is how you can find where every address, the data in every address exists in the cache. Okay. So now let's talk about the spatial account. So we talked, we I mentioned in some in the Here's example that we have more than two words, you're gonna bring two words there, and so on. So let's find out how it works with an example. That's my favorite thing about this module, that we can keep providing examples and you can actually follow what is happening in the cache. So you learn through examples. So let's have another example and see how spatial locality works. Let's say we have a case that has a main memory with a total size of 16 words. Okay. So Every word is a byte, so we should provide this information later. But every word is a byte, so it means that the main memory size would be 16 bytes, and two of the a is equal to 16, so a is equal to 4. Right? So we just have 4 bits in the entire address box. And then we have a cache that has a total size of 4 words, and each line holds 2 words. So each line has 2 words, it means that n is equal to 1. Right? And we have two lines, because it's a total size is four words, and each line has two words, so it means we have two lines, right? So when we have two lines, n would be equal to one as well. So we have n equal to one, and also m equal to one. Okay. Does this make sense, or this, we, we had several examples of this. So m is equal to one, n is equal to one, whatever is left is tag, we don't have a W because every word is one byte. That's the assumption that we have here. Every word has one byte, so you don't have to address different bytes in the board. Okay, is this clear? We have this field, one point, one bits, one bits, two bits. Now with this kind of memory hierarchy that we just explained, let's see what would happen if we had memory references of 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 3, 4, 15. Okay? So it's similar to the case that we had before. It's a little bit more complex because it has more than one word in each line. In the first example, we can just have one word in each line. So this is how spatial locality is going to help us. We're going to get the um, feel of how spatial locality can increase the hit rates. Okay? So we have, the first thing we want to do is memory add a 0. We already know that the line address is in this bit, it's the second bit, we have the word address in the first bit, and then we have tag, two bits of tag here. Okay, so the first zero would be a miss because we don't have anything in the cache. I'm not showing the valid bits here because that's just a simple thing to check. Now it is no, so it's gonna be a miss. Now, now we have to bring something from main memory to cache. What we want to bring is whatever is an address 0, 0, 0, 0. We want to check what line in the cache we should move this data to. What we need to do is we need to check the line address. The line address for this one is 0. Okay, so the line address is the second bit that you can see. The line address is 0, so it means that it should sit in the line 0. Okay, so this is the line that we want to bring this address to. But as I mentioned, when we are bringing this, we also bring every data 
that shares the same line index and tag. Everything that shares the same line index and tag will be brought to the cache along with that first with that data that we need. Okay, so what should I bring here? What other addresses have the same line and the same tag? Line address is some. So if the line address is zero, the tag address is zero, zero. So what other values, what other memory addresses have the first three bits as zero, zero, zero? It would be either be zero, 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 or zero, 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 one, right? We just have two cases. So it means that what we're gonna put here it's going to be the data from memory address 0 and data from memory address 1. So the first word would be here and the second word would be here. So this bit is going to be used to choose between these two. And this field is going to be the tag. So these guys, they both have the same tag and the same line address. Now we brought this here. The next value that we want to read, so this is already in the cache. Okay. The next address that we want to read is 0001. We check the line is 0. So we go here and we see that the value bit is yes. So it means that there is something in that line. Now we have to check and see if that's something that we're looking for is actually the data that we're looking for. For that, we have to check the tag. If we check the tag for this bit, the tag is 00. zero. So it means that, yes, the data that you're looking for is actually in that line, because they share the same tag. Now, where is it? It's in the word address one, so it's in here, not here. So this is how the change address. Is it a hit or miss? It's a hit. So this hit is not because we have seen this data before, it's because of the spatial locality. We went there, we brought the next content to the cache as well. So we got a hit. If it didn't have a special locality, it would have been a miss. So now let's go to the next value, which is two. What we have in the memory is already this. In the cache, we already have this one. So two, we go and check the line. This is line one. If you look at the line one, the value bit for line one is zero, because nothing has been moved to that line. And it means that it's a miss, right? So now when we want to bring 0010, we also bring every other data that shares the same line, cache line address, and the tag. So the tag for this one is 00, the address is 1. If you look at the 3, address 3, it also has the same 001. So now instead of just, it's a miss, but instead of just bringing memory 2, we also bring memory 3 as well. So now cache in this case is fully popular. So now we have the cache is full. Okay, so after this point we have to replace the content or we get lucky and we get access to the same values. So the three, obviously the three would be hit, right? Because we already brought this. Same reason that we got a hit here, special locality. Okay, so this is a hit because of the special locality. Now we want to go to the five, address five. So address 5, this is, this is what we have in the cache. Address 5 has the line 0. So we go to the line 0, and we see that there's something there, so that's valid. So we have to do the next thing, which is checking the tag. Tag is 0, 1 here. There's no tag 0, 1 in this location. So it means that this is a miss. Okay? So it's a miss, but what we need to do is we need to replace the content here with this address. So what do we bring here? So that's the question I wanted to answer. So we have 0, 1, 0. This is the tag, this is the line. Okay. So what other memory address has the same tag and line? Hmm? Where did you know what was that? 4? That's right. 4 is the other memory address that has the same tag and the same line, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so now when we bring 5, 5 is going to sit here, 4 will be here, and the tag will change to 0, 1. 4 is here because the word address is 0, 
This is the word I have this one. So now this value of this cache has changed to this. Now the new content of the cache, we lost the data 0 and 1 here, and we have data 4 and 5. The tag has changed, and we have this value. Number 3 is the next one we want to add. <coughs> X to 3 is a hit. Right, you already see it here. That's good. And we have 4. 4 is a hit because of the special count. Because when we brought 5, we also brought 4 with it. So then another hit because of the special locality. So all the hits that we got here was because of the special locality. Not not all of them. Three was actually, we actually had three here. Now we have 15. The value in memory is this. 15 has the line one. We look at the line one and there is something in the cache. So it means that we have to check the tag. The tag for 15 is one one. And we check compare the tags, they're not equal. So it means that this is a miss, and this should be replaced. But what other memory address did we also bring here? The one that shares the same tag and line, so it should be 111 and 0. So what we bring here will be the value 14, memory 14 and memory 15, and the tag will change to 11. Okay? So this is how special account works. Looking at the hit rate, we have a 50% hit rate. Two of the hits were because of the special locality. Okay, that's how special locality helps us. Okay. So we're done. Uh, next session, we're going to talk about different types of cache misses, and we're going to introduce a new type of cache, which is set associated cache, fully associated.